poetic journey continues with two wonderful speakers. I'm happy to introduce first Chris Swank. Chris Swank is a librarian and faculty member at Pima Community College, Tucson, Arizona, and at Signum University, an online educational institution specializing in imaginative literature and Germanic philology. She is a PhD candidate in English literature at the University of Glasgow and holds an MA in language and literature from Signum University, an MBA from the Thunderbird School of Global Management, and an MLS from the University of Arizona. Her research interests include J.R.R. Tolkien, fantasy literature, and medievalism in literature, television, and film. She has been published in Mythlore, Tolkien Studies, and the Journal of Tolkien Research, as well as several edited collections. Please welcome me in joining Chris Swank. Thank you, Grace. So now we're moving from um, some more uh, overviews to some specific poems in this session. And I will be talking about an archetype that appears in poems by Longfellow, Smith, and Tolkien and trying to draw some lines between the dots. In Carmarthenshire, a youth went out early one morning. Uh, yeah. Just enter or, sorry? Yeah. Ah. In Carmarthenshire, a youth went out early one summer's morning and was lost. An old woman prophesied of him that he was in the fairy's power and would not be released until the last sap of a certain sycamore tree had dried up. When that time came, he returned. He had been listening all the while to the singing of a bird and supposed only a few minutes had elapsed, though 70 years had in fact gone over his head. The Welsh youth, Sean Op Schenken, Sean, son of Jenkin, steps back across the threshold of his house and immediately crumbles to dust. The tale of a man so entranced by the beautiful song of a bird that he does not notice the passage of time has its roots in European folklore and medieval Christian sermons. Folktale versions are numerous and include the Welsh version I just read and versions in English, Estonian, German, Italian, Mexican, Spanish, Dutch, Romanian, Russian, Spanish, and many others. In fact, the motif is so widespread, it has its own classification in the folktale schemes. It is ATU, 471, the monk and the bird. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, the story was published in a variety of folktale collections intended for popular audiences and folklore studies intended for scholars. Here are just a few that mention or reproduce in full a version of the legend of the monk and the bird. According to Gerald, this legend, which has been widely narrated in the course of many centuries, appears to come originally from the annals of the Abbey of Athlingham near Malines in Belgium, in the time of Abbot Fulgentius, who flourished toward the close of the 11th century, where in the folktale tradition, the bird is a harbinger of fairy. In the medieval sermon tradition, the bird is God's representative, and the tale is used as an exemplum, a lesson for lay folk on what they needed to know in order to properly attain heaven. In uh, in this case, it's a meditation on Psalms 90, verse 4. Lord, a thousand years in your eyes are merely a day gone by. Or Psalm, uh, um, 2 Peter 3, 8. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years, one day. In The Monk and the Bird of Paradise, a familiar legend in Sweden, Austria, and Germany, retold by Lillian Gask in her 1910 collection, a monk named Brother Bernard could not imagine himself living in paradise forever without becoming weary of it. He felt that the vesper hymn was sweet, but he wouldn't want to listen to it unceasingly. He wanders into the forest and soon a little bird alights on a branch above his head and begins to sing. So pure and exquisite were the notes that Brother Bernard listened in ecstasy until the sweet song ceased. He returned to his monastery where he discovered he'd been gone for a thousand years. He cried, now I believe, and would fain enter his holy kingdom, uh, whereupon he, his spirit passed away immediately. The Monk and the Bird's song had become by the end of the 13th century, one of the most popular exempla 
Uh, versions appeared in the collected works of Maurice de Sully, Odo de Sheraton, Nicole de Bourzon, Thomas Crane, and the North English homilies. Different branches are distinguished by the monk's name, the location of the monastery, the color of the bird, how long the monk is absent, or whether he dies soon after his adventures. These many versions were included in all the most famous sermon collections and published for a wider audience in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So both as a Christian exemplum and as a folk tale, the story of the monk and the bird song would have been familiar to many in Great Britain and the United States but its use by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow placed it firmly on the pop culture map. Longfellow was the most popular American poet of his day, the author of Evangeline, The Song of Hiawatha, and Paul Revere's Ride. For 32 years, in the middle of the 19th century, he worked on a long dramatic poem with the overarching title, Christus, A Mystery. The Golden Legend, first published in 1851, was the first of the three parts to be written. The title, The Golden Legend, has no association, however, with William Caxton's Golden Legend of 1483. Longfellow's Golden Legend is the story, there he is, is the story of Prince Henry who suffers from a strange malady and the peasant girl Elsie who offers her own blood to cure him even though it may kill her. This illustration by John Henry Frederick Bacon captures the moment in The Golden Legend when Prince Henry has been reading a poem about the monk and the bird's song. And you can see uh, the book uh, discarded there at his right hip on the bench where he's been reading that book. In the poem that Henry was reading, the monk is named Felix and he wanders out of his convent one morning while pondering a volume of St. Augustine. And here is an illustration of, um, of that poem and the Augustine volume is lying discarded at Felix's hip as well. So this was a romantic kind of trope of the discarded book. Uh, Felix enters the woodland and uh, I'll, I'll read a little bit of the poem. And lo, he heard the sudden singing of a bird, a snow white bird that from a cloud dropped down and among the branches brown sat singing so sweet and clear and loud. It seemed a thousand heartstrings ringing. And the monk Felix closed his book and long, long with rapturous look, he listened to the song and hardly breathed or stirred until he saw as in a vision the land Elysian and in the heavenly city heard angelic feet fall on the golden flagging of the street. The bird flies away, Felix hears the convent bell ringing and returns to his convent to discover that what seemed moments only to him was in fact 100 years. His brothers had counted him among the dead and the poem ends, and they knew at last that such had been the power of that celestial and immortal song. A hundred years had passed and had not seemed so long as a single hour. A few pages later, Elsie learns of Henry's illness and that he'll die unless some maiden of her own accord offers her life for that of her Lord and is willing to die in his stead. And so of course she immediately offers to die for Henry and uh, she will be rewarded. The reason that the, the Felix story is in uh, here is a, sort of diegetic um, uh, story, the way the Beowulf stories are, are in Beowulf is to comment on the larger narrative. And Elsie can be promised the same sort of ecstasy in heaven for her bodily sacrifice to Henry as Felix um, experiences when listening to the bird. So although the monk and the bird's song had been around for centuries, its use by Longfellow cemented it into popular consciousness. It's mentioned in an influential 1871 Atlantic Magazine article on the origins of folklore by Fisk. It appeared in Brewer's Dictionary, a phrase and fable beginning in 1894. And Willa Cather used it as an image in her 1902 story, The Professor's Commencement. In 1886, the golden legend was adapted into a wildly popular cantata of the same name by Arthur Sullivan of Gilbert and Sullivan fame. It was the second most popular oratorio in Britain in the late 19th century performed uh, only performed less than Handel's Messiah. However, Sullivan did not include the monk and the bird song episode from the golden legend. Still, it brought it into public consciousness. Several editions of Longfellow's golden legend were published around this time, including a 1910 uh, edition by Howder and Stoughton of London. There's Sullivan's golden legend. Uh, the 1910 edition by Hodder and Stoughton of London was illustrated by late pre-Raphaelite painter and stained glass designer, 
Sydney Herald Metillard, and here's an illustration from that edition of 1910. Uh, the book is now discarded on the ground. It's moved from the hip to the ground. There was also a 12 page booklet that Hodder and Stoughton put out just of the Monk Felix chapter. And these appeared during the active years of Jeffrey Bache Smith's um, years as a poet. In short, Smith and Tolkien had every opportunity to have heard of the golden legend. And as this paper argues, they did. Smith's contribution to the Monk and the Bird song tradition is his undated poem simply titled Legend. In many ways, it's a traditional retelling of the tale but Smith makes some interesting innovations. In the poem, a tattered monk returns after long absence to his abbey and tells his brethren, for a sweet bird sang before me songs of laughter and of tears, all that I have loved and longed for as I measured out my years. The brothers do not recognize him and take him to a cell to pray while they discuss his case. And the eldest of the monks recalls the story of a monk who disappeared from the abbey a hundred years ago. When they go to the cell to ask the stranger if that's him, they find only a seer monk's habit and much dust as of a body crumbled into the grave. The first of Smith's innovations is his decision to recount the tale as a found manuscript. Today, says the narrator, you can see the ruins of the abbey and the monk's story you can read in a forgotten ancient manuscript with an inked illumination of the old saint hearkening to the bird with bright hues, which you may still read and see. Smith uses the same poem within a poem technique that Longfellow does. In Longfellow, the present day reader is reading a book by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow called The Golden Legend, in which a character, Prince Henry, is reading a book about the monk Felix. Smith adds an additional layer. The present day reader is reading a poem by Jeffrey Bache Smith, in which a narrator reads from an illuminated manuscript, wherein the Abbey scribe recounts the story of a lost monk who returned and who himself recounts his ecstatic experience. We can see this story within a story in the shape of the poem. And if you're looking at the poem, you can see that the opening lines, which is just the description of the ruined abbey is unrhymed free verse. And then you start to read from the illuminated manuscript and it's a little more structured. There are lines of three metrical feet with roughly anapestic meter, roughly, but, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba, but no end rhyme or alliteration. Then within that poem are the uh, strange monk's own words, which are more structured and more archaic sounding. If you're looking at the poem, you can see the difference in the shape of the lines. When the monk speaks, it's more anapestic meter, um, two metrical feet per line with an ABCB end rhyme. There's a couple ways you can read this, but here's uh, the anapestic way. Very fair, the golden morning, as in yonder wood I strayed, and I heard diviner music than the greatest harpers made. Or you can read it with a more bouncy iambic tetrameter with the same ABCB end rhyme. Very fair, the golden morning, as in yonder wood I strayed. Either way, it's very different from the um, free verse that opens the poem and that is in the illuminated manuscript. So that you can see that Smith is folding into his poem, this story within a story within a story, mm -hmm. just by the shape of the poetry and the lines. Even the poem recognizes it when the narrator describes the monk's speech as rhythmic. The idea of a story within a story written down long ago in a rediscovered found manuscript presented by a future narrator is something which Tolkien scholars are very familiar with. But Smith plays with this narrative trope uh, decades before Tolkien creates the Red Book of Westmarch, the Notion Club Papers, or even years before the Book of Lost Tales. Other sources and retellings of this story are typically identified by variations on the title, The Monk and the Bird, although I certainly haven't checked or translated all available. The only one I could find that is anything like Smith's legend is Longfellow's The Golden Legend. So I think we can be um, make a fairly safe assertion that he is naming his poem after Longfellow's Golden Legend. He also shares with Longfellow the story within a story technique. But Longfellow was not Smith's only source, which leads to Smith's next innovation. As Carolyn Dinshaw points out, there's no hint in either Longfellow or his German source that the monk Felix dies anytime soon after he returns to the convent. 
On the other hand, there are several versions of the medieval sermon where the monk does die, but typically it's couched in terms like he died, he gave up the ghost, or he passed away. In Smith, we have a seer monk's habit and much dust as if a body crumbled in the grave. And to find anything similar, we must return to the Welsh Shonop Schenken folk story, where Shon cr uh, crosses the threshold of his old farmhouse and crumbled into dust on the doorstep. So we have a couple words that are echoed in both of those. Another option could be the voyage of Bran. And as I have argued, and uh, uh, John has mentioned my argument in one of his um, posts on his website, I think that Smith knew the voyage of Bran quite early, uh, at least in 1911. And when they return from their voyage, the first out of the boat to step on the Irish soil uh, becomes a heap of ashes as though he had been in the earth for many hundred years. And so in the grave or in the earth, it could also be a reflection of the voyage of Bran. If indeed Smith's legend conflates elements from Longfellow's golden legend with Welsh or Irish sources, this could point to a synthesizing impulse on Smith's part. And he would not have been the first. Professor John Rees, famous Celticist, uh, regards the tale of the monk and the bird as simply an ecclesiastical variant of the common story of a sojourner in fairyland. Now this view has been challenged in other scholarship, but nevertheless, it's exactly what Smith is doing. He's conflating um, the medieval Christian sermon um, with the uh, folk tale. We can see this in another innovation of Smith's because he introduces the idea of the overseas other world into the monk and the bird tradition. Just like uh, the voyage of Bran goes to the land of women and Brendan goes to uh, many islands, including the paradise of birds and the, the land of promise of the saints. Um, Smith's unnamed monk thinks about um, blessed shores and golden. So Longfellow only talks about the land Elysian, and in this case, he equates that with the heavenly city. Now, Smith also talks about heaven and angels, but he throws into his poem, blessed shores and golden, where the old dim heroes be, not saints, but heroes, and distant isles of sunset glory set beyond the western sea. So here's the idea of the um, Irish overseas other world coming into this poem about the monk and the bird. And I can find uh, no other uh, versions where that occurred. And I, I read probably about 20 or so different versions of the monk and the bird. There's certainly hundreds out there and I haven't read them all. So Smith imitates uh, Longfellow in some respects. He uses the found uh, manuscript. He adds the found manuscript to the story within a story. He merges religious and folktale traditions, and he introduces the overseas other world. Tolkien's poem, The Death of St. Brendan, is a retelling and revisioning of the popular medieval voyage of St. Brendan, or in Latin, the Navigatio Sancti Brendani, in which the saint does more than experience visions of blessed golden shores. He voyages there to find them. In the Navigatio, Brendan of Clonfair embarks on a sea voyage with several of his brethren to seek the promised land, an earthly paradise. The voyage lasts seven years and encompasses several visits to other world islands before the monks finally reach the promised land. Then they return to Ireland. And in this respect, Tolkien is dealing with a very different type of poem, an Imrav, a medieval narrative of an other world voyage. One of the most famous other world islands in the Imrav tradition is the paradise of birds where angels in the form of birds sit atop a great tree and sing to the glory of God. The birds are actually neutral angels who have been exiled from heaven for failing to take sides in Lucifer's rebellion. And now they must await judgment day before they have a chance to re-enter heaven. Santiago de Salvo writes, to the medieval Christian mind, it would have been perfectly possible that an angel could appear in the form of a bird since God himself in the form of the Holy Spirit uh, descended as a dove in Jesus Christ's baptism. In the Navigatio, the angel birds keep time, helping Brendan and the monks to mark the canonical hours for their daily worship. And they even help him track annual observances. Every year for the seven years of their voyage, the monks celebrate Pentecost on the paradise of birds. So in essence, the angel birds are divine time keepers. But in Tolkien's poem, Brendan and his monks pass out of linear time and into eternal time as Brendan stands beneath a great white tree and experiences a same sort of ecstatic 
timelessness as does Longfellow's Felix and Smith's Nameless Monk. This is from The, the Death of St. Brendan uh, by Tolkien. We deemed then maybe as in a dream that time had passed away for our journey ended for no return we hoped but there to stay. So the angel birds in Tolkien's Death of St. Brendan are in fact not angels, nor are they birds. Tolkien writes, from the sky came dropping down on high, a music, not a bird, not a voice of man, nor angel's voice, but maybe there is a third fair kindred in the world, yet lingers beyond the foundered land. So the singers are elves, where the white rational talking birds in the Navigatio hold a liminal position between the spiritual and the physical world, Tolkien's elves hold a similar liminal position between humans and angels. And the, el uh, the use of elves here represents a very rare mix of Christian elements and fairy tale elements in Tolkien's works. DeSalvo notes that Tolkien did understand the very subtle link between birds resulting from both the shape shifting uh, in pagan magic folklore texts and birds as messengers in medieval angiography. He employs them frequently, Elwing in the form of a swan, the great eagle Thorondor, the raven and the thrush and the hobbit are all bird messengers and helpers. Also like Smith, Tolkien employs a complex narrative frame, utilizing the device of a found manuscript. The poem was later revised and retitled Imrav and published as a standalone poem in the magazine Time and Tide in 1955. However, in its original form, as the death of St. Brendan, it was intended to be part of Tolkien's unfinished novel, The Notion Club Papers, which he worked on in 1945. Remember, I used three Matryoshka dolls for Longfellow and four for Smith. Tolkien needs a few more. <laughs> in Tolkien's uh, Death of St. Brendan, we have the present day reader is reading a fragment from a 1945 unfinished novel by Tolkien called The Notion Club Papers which presents the fictitious second edition of a book published sometime after 2012 called The Notion Club Papers with commentary by Messrs. Wormwood and Barrow, which was originally published by the editor Howard Green, who reportedly discovered in a waste paper basket in the year 2012, the minutes of a mysterious Notion Club from about 1980 to 1990, written by club secretary Nicholas Guildford, in which one of the club members, Philip Frankly, recites a poem that came to him in a dream where St. Brendan tells the story in his own words of his other world voyage to the promised land in about AD 577. So we have layers within layers within layers of, of Tolkien's um, framing concept. So he complicates even more what Longfellow and Smith did. Just like in Smith's uh, poem, St. Brendan also dies shortly after he returns from his contact with the other world. At the poem's end, we learn St. Brendan had come to his life's end under a rain-clad sky, and journeying when no ship returns, his bones in Ireland lie. And although Brendan's narrator says no ship returns from the other world, Brendan's ship has returned. But like others in Tolkien's Middle Earth corpus who go beyond the boundaries of the mortal world, Tolkien cannot long remain back in linear time. Although unlike Smith's nameless monk and the Welsh shown up Schenken, Tolkien's Brendan does not immediately crumble to dust. All right, so what can we do with all of these three different poems and how they're presented? In all three, we have monks recounting ecstatic experiences to other monks um, in which singing of birds or beings that are likened to birds sing from a tree or above it, and I'll get that to it in a second, trigger a slip into the timelessness for the monk. The monk returns to linear time where he discovers he's been gone from the monastery for several years. Unable to remain back in linear time, both Smith and Tolkien's monks, though not explicitly Longfellow's, die soon after recounting their experiences. And Smith's monk crumbles to dust. All three are presented as stories within stories. Longfellow's Henry reads about the monk Felix in a book. Smith's narrator reads about the unnamed monk in an illuminated manuscript. And Tolkien's Philip Frankly recites a poem about St. Brandon that came to him in a dream, which is recounted in the minutes of a mysterious scholarly club found in a waste paper basket in an old Oxford building. There are also some parallels between Smith's legend and Tolkien's death of St. Brendan, which are not features of Longfellow. Both synthesize the religious and folklore traditions. We have both saints and fairies present and the earthly paradise and the overseas other world. 
and in both the monk dies soon after returning from the journey. But there's also a parallel stanza in Longfellow and Tolkien, which is not a feature in Smith. The descriptions of the birds in the trees. There are three most likely versions of the Brendan legend that Tolkien was familiar with, the Latin Navigatio, the Anglo-Norman voyage, and the South English legendary. And he himself uh, in the Notion Club papers mentions the Navigatio and the Anglo, he doesn't say Anglo-Norman, um, Anglo-French thing. Uh, in all three, the angel bird is already on the tree and alights down to speak with Brendan in the boat, just like in this marginal illustration from a 15th century German manuscript. However, in both Longfellow and Tolkien, the bird or bird-like singer are actually in the sky and drop down into the tree to speak with the uh, human being. Longfellow's monk Felix sees a snow white bird Tolkien's Brendan sees leaves as white as birds, white as winter. Longfellow's singing bird from a cloud dropped down. Tolkien's fair singers from the sky came dropping down. And Longfellow's birds sang among the branches, branches brown while Tolkien's white leaves left the branches bare. Okay, it's not a lot to go on, I admit, uh, but none of these details and nothing even like them appear in Smith's poem or in any of the other um, versions of the monk and the bird that I read. So it's at least suggestive that Tolkien was influenced not only by Longfellow through Smith, but also directly by Longfellow. So what we might have is both Smith and Tolkien reading Longfellow's poem and reacting to it at different times um, in their career. Sorry, my slides I was not keeping up with. So what I originally thought was a very simple kind of chain of, of influence, which was Longfellow to Smith to Tolkien when I first started this project, then started to look like Longfellow to both Smith and Tolkien, and then Smith and Tolkien to each other. So we have this sort of circular thing. But really, when I started to think of it, it's a much more complex um, chain of influence. And it's, and this is just the ones I talked about, right? There's, there's more even behind here. But we've got both the Welsh uh, Shonop Schenken and the Voyage of Bran affecting Smith. Tolkien also knows the Voyage of Bran, and he mentions it in 1924. Um, and of course, the Navigatio Safety Brindani, he also mentions in 1924 and keeps talking about it throughout the rest of his life. Smith and Tolkien have things in each other's poems that reflect one another. Longfellow is a source both for Smith and Tolkien directly, and then Longfellow's source was von der Hagen's German um, exemplum. Uh, German version of the monk and the bird story. So we really end up with this beautiful kind of web of influence, this interlace and intertextuality from all of them. So we think we know about Tolkien's poems, having studied them for uh, a good long time, this the anniversary, 50th anniversary of his death. And the death of St. Brendan and its later version, Imrav, right, it comes from St. Brendan, and maybe we're tempted not to look any further than that but it could be embedded in these poems that there is in fact another monk who also influenced Tolkien's in rock. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was really fascinating. I'd like you to join me now in welcoming Frederica Calabrese, Reze? Calabrese. Calabrese, who was born in Bari, is a graduate in classical literature and archaeology. She holds a PhD in history as well as an underwater archaeologist. Her research interests focus on late antiquity with particular attention to the earliest traces of Christianization on British soil, the study of the apocryphal gospels, and the cultic traditions of contemporary Apulia. Thank you. Welcome, Frederica.
Thank you for having me. Now my uh, speech is entitled From the Domes to the Tide of Time, Smith and Tolkien in the Myths of Glastonbury Legends. We have already said that um, uh, inside the TCBS, Geoffrey was the poetic soul, and some of his poems were published posthumously in 1918 in the collection Spring, A Spring Out Vest, and it was Tolkien himself who edited the collection and wrote the introductory notes. Let's start from this. The poems in this book were written at different times, one, I believe, even as early as 1910, but the order in which they are here given is not chronological beyond the fact that the third part contains only poems written after the outbreak of the war. Of these, some were written in England, at Oxford in particular, some in Wales, and some and many others during a year in France from November 1915 to December 1916, which was broken by one lip in the middle of May. The final version was sent to me from the trenches. Beyond this part, few facts, no prelude and envoi is needed other than those printed here as left by the author. Here, the professor underlines two important elements. First of all, the places of production of the collection, which are essential for the purposes of understanding its constituent elements and of choosing some traditions rather than others. And the precise will of Tolkien himself not to edit anything of his friend's text, but to deliver them as they were received. Starting right from the preface sentence, the final version was sent to me from the trenches. We enter the text of the poem, Glastonbury, whose first verse draws an impervious and gloomy scenario, that of war. It is here that Smith makes a comparison with the war context in which he had to find himself. Life on the Western, the Western Front was often lonely, stressful, grueling, and fatiguing for a peasant's health. During his war service, Smith came to mirror his own depiction of the night bedeeper in his pre-war poem, Weary and Troubled State and Sick at Heart. After meeting Tolkien while on leave, Smith writes upon returning to France, me, I have no doubt you found different, more tired and less vigorous. A revelation indicative of an immune system weakened by unconsciously high levels of stress for nutrition and unearthly living conditions. Officers also had great responsibility for the lives and the welfare of others and were often required to perform duties that were mentally draining. In another letter, Smith laments the sheer vacancy afflicting him while serving as battalion billeting officer, a dull but important role of turning out routine, marching gathered and going ahead of troops to arrange accommodation. Ismail's manifest it already in the first line, comparing himself to a character of Bediver, who wanders at gloomy breaking of a winter's day. Bedver is one of the Knights of the Round Table of the Arthurian legends, and it was he, according to later literacy tradition, especially in Thomas Mallory's Death of Arthur, in, and in the alliterative Mort Arthur, who returned Excalibur to the Lady of the Lake after the Battle of Camelon. After the death of his master, he retired to Hermitage for the rest of his life. He appears in the Mabinogion at Arthur's court, where he was marshal and is often associated with Sir Kai. Along with Kai Her and Gawain, appears in Geoffrey of Monmouth's Historia Regum Britanniae as one of his loyalists. He helps Arthur and Kai fight the giant of Mont Saint Michael and joins Arthur in his war against the Emperor Lucius of Rome. He would have died during the continental campaigns. It is, in fact, from these last campaigns that Tolkien's The Fall of Arthur starts. It is an alliterative poem inaugurated by Tolkien in the 1930s, but never concluded, where human pride moves the ranks of history. 
moved by heroic glory, by armorous tension, or by the lust for power, King Arthur, the faithful Lancelot, the shining Gawain, the usurper Mordred, and the fairy Guinevere ride the tide of time but collide with an unelectable fate that will inevitably lead to the fall of the kingdom and their ambitions. In five counters, the professor clashes and meets with the matter of Brighton, ending the courtly and Christian contents to direct the ship of the narration to different landing to wrap us westward. The colorful world of chivalry and courtly love created in the medieval French tradition by Chrétien de Troyes and Marie de France is not described. There are not just tournaments, knights, and ladies playing games of love, no ideal world enclosed within the walls of the Camelot. There are no merely Morgan Le Fay or other words. There is no grave, no cast for a spiritual version to expose the frailty of earthly realm. The professor, on the other hand, offers a dark story whose prevailing image is the tide, which embodies the flow of events upon which the actors are driving. Talking the force stripped out the story of all decoration and reduces it to the essentials, to a warrior king whose pride precedes a fall, to a traitor nephew, to a faithful knight and an infidel, to an adulterous queen. The action moves inexorably towards a final struggle, which the author presents as inevitable and dependent on the interviewing wills of a predestined cast of characters. Arthur, Mordred, Gawain, and Lancelot, with Guinevere as both spectator and prize. The mood is dark and turbulent, which repeated, uh, with repeated images of rushing winds and rock seas with the weather reflecting human drama and the author's fleet, like the story itself, riding a restless sea. Crossing the storm, Bedver reaches a hermitage hard by a little hill and sheltering trees. This hidden place is not Smith's invention. In a note at the end of the first chapter of the De Antiquitate Glastoniensis Ecclesia, the legend of the foundation of Glastonbury, the historian William of Malmesbury recalls the presence of spring water with an unusual color and flavor. The exact location is not mentioned, but thanks to the presence of internal references to the figures of Lancelot du Lac, while one and a half meet, the, the story seems to be comparable to the eye history of the Holy Grail and the subsequent mort by Thomas Mallory, according to which Lancelot and the other survivors of the Battle of Camelan retired to a monastery in a small valley near Glastonbury, conceding um, with the slope between the Tor and today's Callis Hill, the present site of Callis Well. The knights go rowing along the river and Lancelot rides until the comet to the foot of the mountain and feed at a hermitage beside a spring. In the Somerset region, a strong, uh, a strong stream from the Bristol Channel, the landscape appeared as composite. The flat territories of the levels were joined by the land properties beyond the mandates. In this marshy environment, alternating with small areas of emergent, uh, emerged and fertile land, small hermitages that housed modest communities of monks probably found their place. In all in the Somerset levels, 14 of them have been identified, including Beckery and the Tor. The Tor Hill rises to 158 meters and dominates the surrounding landscape. With the remains of St. Michael's Church, where it's on its summit, it stands out as an iconic landmark for the area. The inhabited area is uh, concentrated on the lower and lateral slopes, covering almost three sides and expands on a series of uh, small plateaus of variable height between 80 and 90 meters. A few small streams flow into modest valleys located on the lower northern slopes and create a series of ridges and gullies. Thousands of years ago, the Tor was probably one, uh, one of the islands that emerged from a territory completely surrounded by water. 
This element contributed to the development of the most ancient beliefs regarding the consideration of the place as a center of regeneration and life. The hills were seen in primitive rituals as bridges between the heart and the sky, as they were believed to constitute a link between material reality and invisible dimensions. It is therefore likely to argue that Smith was referring to a lower slope, little, and with a general trend that the previous one at whose foot to the south is the healing spring of Cali's well. Like many places in Glastonbury's orbit, Cali's Hill also preserves stories connected to supernatural powers of the Celtic and the world. The next verse with the mention will prove it. Then the sleep bathed him in soothing water, soft and deep, and left, uh, left him war at breaking of the light. The description of the Glastonbury landscape is similar to Tolkien's text. Just to, just to quote something, on the shining shores and shallow waters of South Brighton, uh, in some hollow the hills eat from mortals. Although the editor of the four, Christopher Tolkien, claims that the father had voluntarily left the town in the heart of uh, West Somerset out of his reconstructing of the Arthurian legends, an indication of southern Brighton, a place surrounded by marshy spaces where hills and other slopes emerge, perpetually surrounded by fog, will seem to coincide with Glastonbury. Here, Bedver, Sorry. Here, Bedver finds a hermit who introduces him himself as bishop at Arthur's court. Going deeper into the internal organization of Glastonbury, we know that in the 12th century, with the election of Savary as leader of the community of Bath, an authoritative, uh, authoritative man and above all in good relations with King John, an attempt was made to merge the chairs of Bath and Glastonbury. In 1195, in fact, Savaric himself was granted the status of Bishop of Bath and Glastonbury by Pope Celestin III after having annexed the latter to the former. On the threshold of the 13th century, a papal decree formally united the two monasteries and Glastonbury was raised to the rank of cathedral, now governed by bishop. Smith not only carries out a literary operation, but also a historical one, going precisely to place the meeting between Bedver and Bishop at the temporal level, the terminus post quem is 1195, the year in which Savarek was elected Bishop of Bath in Glastonbury. Returning to the verses of the British poet and to that hermitage hard by a little hill, Smith, unlike his friend Tolkien, not only openly declares that we are in Somerset, but inevitably links the events of Glastonbury to the Arthurian tales, starting from the defeat of King and the fall of his kingdom. When, at the last, the war was overthrown with fraud and ill designs. Smith shows not only that he knows the text linked to the Arthurian tradition, but that it takes up some topic. In the alliterative mortal to Arthur, uh, preserved in the library of Lincoln Cathedral, the protagonist is Fortune, who, in a dream, raises Arthur to the top of his wheel, admonishing him, however, that enough had been raised to glory and to domination, and that it is time to turn the wheel inexorably. Awaken, Arthur, seek Six advice from a philosopher whose sentence will seem unequivocal. You have shed much blood and destroyed innocent people in your arrogance in the lands of many kings. Confess your shames and prepare for your hands. For your hand, you have had a vision. Or okay, king, take note of it if you will, because disaster, disaster, disastrously, you will fall within five winters. The element of the will is fully used by the poets. In Tolkien's other Arthurian work, on the other hand, what fails is fortune, replaced by the looming of events dictated by fate that Arthur tries in vain to stop. His heart forbore that his eyes was doomed, the ancient world to its unfolding and the tides of time turned against him.
in. Fourth myth is not time, but the war that throws bad verb between its tides, the unstable and overwhelming tide of war. Instead, it is at tones of time that the author tells of an island on a lake mystically set. The mention in the Geoffrey of Mouth Historia Regum that the king mortally wounded during the last battle of Camelon was transported to Avalon to nose his wounds was used by the monks, whose suffering caused the final destination of the king at Glastonbury, using the words of the Vita Gilde of Caradoc of Langforn, which identified the Somerset site precisely with the sacred island of Geoffrey. John of Glastonbury will lead him to the drafting of his chronicle to officially sanction this union and gradual liberation. Section 13, in which the monk is lavishly represents Geoffrey's affirmations, contains a programmatic indication. From these facts, then, it is clear why it is considered an island and why it is called both Avalon and Glastonbury. The use of the historical literary works, however, could not be enough, and the monks of the Abbey, led by the Freisein Abbot de Sali, worked for the construction of the tumulus of the King of the Brightons and his wife, Geneva. In, in 1192, the event of the exhumation of their royal remains had an unprecedented resonance. Gerald of Wales described the discovery of two wooden chests with the remains of the sovereigns, together with a wooden cross engraved with the phrase Ichiacet sepultus inclitus rex Arturius in insula Avalonia. In Avalon came wandering Saint Joseph, even if that tented God's frail body and unrolled in linen clothes of spice fragrance. He broke the vessel banished now from her that broke destruction to the uh, the table round, since many deemed themselves above their work and sought in vain and perished here it found. Moving on to more contemporary years, the Englishman Charles Aston accurately described the legend of the Glastonbury Thor and is a little monument of the once famous abbey uh, that was published posthumously by his friend Thomas Hearn. Um, the text proposed a dialogue he had with the local innkeeper who allegedly told him of the landing of Joseph and his disciples in Avalon and of his staff planted on the top on Wero Hill, from which a particular variety of octone would have sprouted. However, the oldest documentation concerning the Holy Thorn is in the life of Joseph of Arimathea, edited in 1520 by Richard Pinson. Joseph, who arrived together with a group of the other 11 disciples on the shores of Babylon in December, planted his stick into the ground, indicated the end of his pilgrimage. From the shaft, it sprouted a plant which thereafter stood imperiously on Wirior Hill. The particularity preserved by this vegetable is that it blooms twice a year, during the Christmas period and in the month of May. This event has been considered exceptional and salvific in the 16th, uh, since the 16th century, and this sacredness has been linked to two key episodes of the Christianity, the birth of Christ and his passion. In the canonical text, especially in the Gospels, the information related to Joseph of Arimathea is limited and certainly not exhaustive. In Luke, it is said that there was a man named Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, who did not adhere to the decision and the work of the others. Here, the reference is to the failure to include Joseph in the group of Jesus' disciples. His origin is indicated from the city of Arimathea, and what he did. On the eve of Saturday, he asked Pontius Pilate for the body of Christ. He took it down from the cross, covered it with a sheet, and placed it in a new tomb dug out of the rock. According to the apocryphal tradition, traditions, in particular the Gospel of Nicodemus, the Arimathea's arrived at Glastonbury, bringing with them the basin. Um, 
the basin in which she had collected water and blood from the washing of the body of Jesus taken down from the cross. With this artifact, it was buried, but now it has vanished. And it was once the cause, uh, the cause of the defeat of the round table. Here, the English poet uses the French tradition of Chrétien de Troyes with the mention of a single base. Instead, in Glastonbury, starting from the 14th century chronicle of John of Glastonbury, the alternative story spread of this present of two cups, which once buried will have given rise to the two sacred sources of Glastonian territory, the San Joseph Well, or Blood Spring, and the White Spring. Now, I saw the last in battle in the midst. Doth mark the ultimate leagues of this fair land, and alien hopes lives people, alien fates going on across the waters like a wandering soul returned from the woeful realm to view the ancient haunts well loved that once knew. Smith, in his verse, uses not only archaic terms such as haunts, but also ambivalent terms to recall the mystical fairy life forms present on the island of Avalon and close in the mist. Instead, the professor, in letter number 131 of 1951, addressed to Milton Walkman, speaking precisely of the fable like elements present in the matter of Brighton, writes, for one thing, it's fairy to lavish and fantastical, incoherent and repetitive. The professor uses the term fair, uh, lavish to present an elaborate subject, visibly overabundant with linguistic devices and supernatural elements. We must not forget that Arthurian fiction was born in the Middle Ages, therefore it was designed to attract an audience that was familiar with both the fantastic elements and the Kivarek and Christian ones. Nonetheless, the professor fairy uh, turns out to be less sumptuous and fantastic. In the Lord of the Rings, we meet enchanted fountains, shapeshifters, magical talismans, wizards, and so on. From this point of view, the comparison between Gandalf and Merlin, Galadriel and Morgan Le Fay, between the search for the ring and that of the Holy Grail would seem natural. Tolkien, however, would seem to carry out a purge in his fall, but this is not entirely the case. It is the case of Queen Guinevere with gleaming limbs as fair and pale as a woman, or the meticulous description of landscapes that in the huge twilight glint glossy pale and so on. Going on, there stands a chapel, ancient and well worn, and there they worship in these days of yore the sons of kings. Also, in the De Antiquitate, the burial of King Arthur at Glastonbury is mentioned, positioned between two pyramids. Smith resents the tradition of a monumental place where once English kings were buried before the destruction of the place by Henry VIII in 1539. The royal dynasty, however, had not only lent their names to the monastery, but they had granted several donations to the complex when it was still in use. Chapter 33 of the A, of the Antiquitate, in fact, is dedicated to the donation to the complex and uh, that have a uh, donation that have occurred over the years. The monks, however, felt the need to make a clarification to identify the exact location of the two pyramids, making known their function as indicators of ancient and sacred burials. Then Smith says, in at the Gatterway Chapel, I went down and found that they had digged a grave must meet for one of saintly life or king by birth. Gerald of Wales described the exhumation of the bodies of Arthur and Guinevere in 1182, enclosing the old oak between two stone pyramids. The king displayed bones and a skull larger than any other man, 
while the queen still retained a lock of air, which, however, as soon as touched, it turned into ashes. However, there was no lack of subtle attacks on some of Giraldo's inventions regarding the discovery of Arthur Stone, the anonymous analyst of Morgan writes. They recovered a certain sarcophagus in which they recognized what appeared to be the bones of a woman with almost incorrupt hair, which they set aside. They took in another body lying beneath the first, in which the bones of a man were contained, and likewise by moving this aside. Underlying here is an observation of the fraud carried out by the Glastonian monks without, however, ever openly addressing in his terms. Let's move at the end of, um, to the figure of king, the king himself. His armor and visage fold with blood and slime and fading in his eyes the ancient flame, and so on. This passage finds a parallel with Tolkien's description of the king of the Brightons. Let's start from the consideration that Tolkien's entire work on Arthur revolves around five main characters who act and interact by moving the trees of the plot, the first part is devoted entirely to the figures of Arthur and Gawain, as in the fourth. The king and his men are campaigning on the continent when they learn that Mordred, who had been left behind as a regent, has declared himself king and has hired hordes of mercenaries. Arthur decides it will be the, last, the, the best thing to go back. The battle with Mordred is the immediate but not the least cause of Arthur's death. The tide of time have reached the ruler as well as all men. Guinevere and Lancelot have already committed adultery, their own table company is dissolved, the queen is pardoned, but the king's favorite knight is exiled. Tolkien attributes the king's incursion towards his to the desire for pride and glory. Even if this could be understood as a natural heroic desire, we must consider here that the meaning conferred by the professor. Pride in a subordinate soldier was considered tre treason, but such an attitude attributed to the Anglo-Saxon leader was disloyal as well as disastrous for his soldiers. In this respect of profound inspiration to the professor must have been the Battle of Malden. An 11th century poetic retelling of the battle fought in 991 AD between the Essex Saxon and the Viking forces. First, he outlines the tactical situation at Malden, with two armies stationed on opposite sides of a fort from Northley Island to the mainland. The Vikings tried to force the passage first, provoking the opponent Beth of Not, who allows them to make the crossing, allowing for an equal match of the deployed forces. The Saxon Duke allows them to cross the way, causing a fatal confrontation in which he and his soldiers perish. Tolkien focuses on Beth of Not's decision, to, uh, considering it the decisive and determining moment of the fall, considering these acts of pride and mystery place, Giverly proved fatal. Even if the description of the king is different, is Miss Poetry, it must be said that the British poet, poet uses the term accursed to indicate the misfortune that will soon befall Camelot. This is a literary term that stands etymologically between cursed and terrible. Just a few words about the other characters. In such wise came Lancelot, the hero of immortal fights. And then the queen, Ineva, that was, whom now a convent's shame in prisons and dark and said pale, and so on. Here the similarities between Smith and Tolkien are evident. Tolkien's Gineva is a femme fatale, cold and calculating, who captures and implicitly seduces men, leading them astray from the path of Kibaris' virtue and loyalty. She's a woman who rides events, first seeking the satisfaction of her need, taking advantage of every situation. Like Mordred, she should master chance and tide of time turn to her purpose. The repeated phrase accompanying Tolkien's Gineva as fair and fell as fair woman seems intended to combine Gineva with Morgan Le Fay, 
who in Mallory was Arthur traditional nemesis. However, she is not a witch, but her effect on men and events is similar to that of magical spells. For Mordred, she is such walking into the world to ruin or to the ruin of men. The same is true for Lancelot, not only Queen and Lady of his heart, but Lady Ruthless as fair as pay woman. Guinevere with golden hair and beautiful but equally cruel limbs deviates from the traditional immaculate image of her. Her desire was to take Arthur's kingdom at the age of his splendor, as well as to carnally possess Lancelot during his reign, the pinnacle of his glory. And then Lancelot. His chivalrous pride, once devoted to the throne of Camelot, soon, uh, soon turned into armorous glory, dragging him to the mercy of fate and destiny the alliance denies to break. Despite his redemption, the knight's nice forgiveness will not come. He lord betrayed to love fielding, and love forsaking lord regained not. While Guinevere's pride was in the control of the others, Lancelot's pride was in the service of his lady and his king. It was when this loyalty conflicted and Benwick's knight fell and took with him the peace of the real. The immortal the loveliness of God of the burnt out earth, the wandering wind, God of patrons that vanished long ago, and so on. This reference in Smith is to Celtic gods, to a nation cult that has almost disappeared, but which remains imprinted in the Glastonian spirituality. The difference with Tolkien is related to the fact that if Smith empties the pagan culture, the professor instead wants to empty the Arthurian myth from all markedly Christian elements that have distorted its image over centuries. Again. The fourth, regarding the accusation of a marked Christian influence of the Arthurian legends present in the latter aforementioned, uh, in the latter aforementioned, Tolkien empties his poem of explicitly doctrinal elements. In this way, the story is complete, credible, as well as providing consistency to Tolkien's <coughs> sub-creation. However, one could object that the previous statement by listing explicit reference in the songs may God keep us in hope alight, heart united, as the kindred blood in our bodies concert Arthur and the way. In this verses, the term God is not actually the focus of the stanza, mostly shifted to Gawain's loyalty to Arthur and their chivalrous qualities. On the contrary, the English poet, through the mouth of the bishop, declares that the only possible solution is to entrust oneself to the Christian faith. Verily, when I come into this place, I railed on God that I had lost my soul. In conclusion, Smith, in just over 30 stanzas, paints the colorful picture of Glastonbury, a town surrounded by mist and its legends. Of that mystically set Lake Island, he evokes legends, traditions, mysteries, telling a different story from the others, and still alive, not only in the collective imagination, but also in this one, as a poet, and of Tolkien as a scholar. After all, just using the words of the Reverend Lionel Smith, this story is long overdue. Would that someone more fitting had written it? I am only fitted by my love of the place and its wondrous story. It had to be done. So I have done it. As you have not done it, do not be too hard on one who has at least tried with a minimum of time at his disposal. I launch it into the world and if it be read in the spirit in which it is written, it must do some good. I launched it into the work, and so I hope you will appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, we're now going to open up the floor for questions, so if you have 
Questions for either speaker? You uh, raise your hand. Yes. Yes, this is to Chris Wright. Thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. Very enlightening. And there may be an additional element in the vegetarian that is relevant to the section of the month of third. And that could be the, the event that takes place in the uh, in the Iberian, where Elway is uh, attracted by the sound of the birds and follows them, and then he's in trance when he meets with Miriam. And Campus yes. hears a song until he actually comes out and is yes, yes. and becomes a little girl. Um, on, on the same thread, um, yeah, thanks, Chris, again, for the fascinating why um, I'm not even back to the doll thing with stories within the stories of Russian dolls. <laughs> uh, I'm also reminded of how the Witch King becomes an empty cloak sort of when his immortality unmits itself. Mm. Um, and that set me thinking about, well, so who who has the witch king listened to? Not a bird in a tree, but Sauron, of course. And then I remember there's this odd thing in uh, the first version of the Fall of Numenor, where Sauron arrives in Numenor um, as a great bird. Mm -hmm. And he proceeds to tell them, I can bring you an eternal life. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if that was, you know, the back of his mind in. Um, in devising that short-lived image of sound and then. Thank you, John. Uh, Gabriel, I saw you had your hand up. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I did. Thank you very much. It's a kind of question for both speakers. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, uh, Rory, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, I think, the idea that um, when Arthur and Renevere were exhumed at Glastonbury. Um, they were skeletons, but Renevere's hair was intact, and one of the monks went down and took up the hair and it crumbled into dust. And this is recounted in two manuscripts by uh, Gerald of Wales. And Chris, when you were talking about this idea about the monk disappearing into dust, um, to going back to earlier sources, medieval sources, uh, I thought of that story as well. Um, and it, this might be worth thinking about because um, quite a few poets have picked up on that idea of the, the, the hair turning into dust, um, or we did the hair, sort of, I think, the late 19th century, but also an Oxford war poet, Alan Rice Oxley, um, wrote a poem about this event as well um, in Iraq. I think it was published around 1918, and, and he seems to be making a point about the kind of how nothing lasts, um, you know, you don't, don't focus on beauty, nothing lasts. And so I don't think that Smith and Tolkien are sort of drawing on, on that story particularly, um, but there does seem to be like an idea about kind of a great sense of loss, um, it, it, nothing lasting. And so I just I was just curious um, how you had any thoughts on that, um, whether you kind of thought about that story uh, in particular when you were thinking about Glastonbury and Chris, whether you think there might be another connection there to you to that story, just to add to your complex um, web of connections. Thank you. Um, you're right. Uh, this is, there is this idea of losing something, uh, something that not lasts. But, you know, the idea of Gerald of Wales in that context, uh, it was to demonstrate that there were Farid, Geneva, and Arthur, okay? Just because Henry II wanted to conquest that area, the Somerset area, so that problem that was a fraud, of course. And after this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, mediatic event, because each of the, the king just choose the best of the historians of Welsh people that once uh, believed that uh, the king Arthur was a once and future king. So demonstrating that there is the, 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 the sarcophagus, there were bones of this king. He demonstrated that it was death, definitely, definitely death. So there was no chance to go on and uh, hope that we'll return and save death. 
from the new king because it was basically uh, from a French origin. So the Plantagenets they were French. So the indigenous population was not so kind of uh, not gentle, but they were skeptical about this domination, you know. So he understands how to conquest the indigenous people. But yet, of course, uh, coming back to Smith and Tolkien, there could be this idea of, you know, something that you lose and beauty is something not material. Just oh, it's material, sorry. Hair is, you know, famously you keep hair and you put it yeah, in the middle of course. talking to us about But this specific so. word, blonde hair, yeah. you know, it's just uh, uh, referring to Dinova in particular. Then the idea of the big skull, big bones, uh, are related to the fact that in Celtic mind, indigenous mind, the big skull was uh, similar to importance, regal, uh, uh, just uh, the nature of a king imposes some aspects, just like big skull, big bones, and so on. Thank you for your observation. Yes, Bethe. Yeah, thank you for both of your papers. I found what they struck me, you made very clear how both the talking and Smith are, are engaged in some sort of <coughs> cultural hybridization. They really try to put on different sources uh, into the own thing. And if uh, I'm here a bit anticipating what uh, I'm going to say later, but for me it's very striking how. At the end of the collection of Spring Harvest, where the burial of Sophocles, uh, which seems to have a completely different setting. It's a classical setting, uh, there is a classical uh, playwright, uh, and there are the classical gods, and there is a whole list of the uh, pantheon. And yet, there is something which is very Celtic. The old area of that poem is the over the poem is very Celtic. Uh, there isn't a formal feature which is very intriguing, which is the meter of the position. The first section of the Bombay of Sophocles, which is Hyman Autosyndrome, so, which has, I think, you know, is a very typical meter of Anglo poetry or uh, Anglo French poetry. And in fact, it is used uh, for one of well, the first time, time in history in the volume of St. Brendan. And uh, also in the volume of Sophocles, we have reference to fairies, uh, and we have this fairy player, so it really becomes a bit like Brendan or Brown in the different versions, uh, and also becomes a bit like Aaron. Yeah. Because another character in the uh, Tolkien the mythology who shares so many similarities with all these characters, the solitary figures uh, traveling on their own some journey to the other seas, to the underworld, and they die or they kind of engage some sort of a uh, uh, change uh, is indeed what, what goes on. And I think it's also interesting that there are another metrical similarities between uh, the Tale of Aaron and Bimbo's version, and indeed. Uh, uh, in the voyage of Brenda, because we, we still have other syllables uh, which do not rhyme perfectly, but they rhyme as in the, the burden of Sophocles, which is incomplete. For the secret section of the burden of Sophocles, so we can see how uh, we started with the sense of medical pattern, they kind of uh, didn't finish the form. So many of the, of the lines do not really rhyme, but they are assonances, which is what talking uses in the poem of Bimba. Again, it's very difficult to be certain that all these things are related, okay? But it's quite clear that there is something uh, similar in this idea of traveling. Uh, in, the, in, in a way, we can consider all the dif different uh, tales we have seen today, and the burial of Sophocles are all legend at the beginning. Uh, different versions uh, of the same sort of motif uh, also share the similarity of uh, engaging with sort of cultural organization, which is also very intriguing. Because in, in, in Smith, this is still. Uh, in a way, impotent, yeah, but we're still talking to the verbs. I think they, another thing that we can draw between these two poets uh, is this. You know, as John mentioned, we have their letters from the war because they were separate from each other, that they sent their poems back and forth, and so we know that they read each other's. And we can only imagine, because we weren't there, that when they were both at Oxford, that they also handed their poems back and forth. I don't know, but I imagine that they did. And, and saw something in each other's poems, and Smith is like, oh, and, and maybe not even consciously, but he picks it up in the next thing that he writes, and um, it's, you know, we were all in some point in our <coughs> lives with other people that you're talking about your, your work, and you get ideas from them, and it's those those things that we can't really track, and we unless we recorded everything that they ever said to one another, 
follow along behind them, but you have to think that a lot that they influenced one another a lot in those in the, those months that, that, that they were here together. If I can ask some thing um, about the image of this tree and up on above there is this bird. Uh, you know, the Celtic idea, of course, of a white oak mm -hmm. with roots, strong roots, and then uh, on top of this nest of uh, white birds is typical in a typical image or the connection between the other world and uh, you know, the mortal world and the other world in Celtic idea. So I saw also that uh, the picture that you showed. Uh, it, at the bottom, there is the Celtic, not three scale, but the Celtic symbol. Mm -hmm. So it was really a powerful image that I think that there is really um, strong into the mind, or into the mind of the Smith or as a poet and both in the toy as well. I think you're right, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, a couple of points. Um, when when, when Jenny mentioned um, Melian and Ingo earlier, there was, um, I believe, um, Melian was associated with, with, with Nightingales. Um, yes. And I was wondering if um, uh, there was any, you were aware of any use of Nightingale in any of the sources that we were looking at. Um, and the other point was um, maybe misremembering, but in, in the Babo White Skin, I think there's so maybe something commonly in the duck there. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and then in your final slide, you talked about the uh, difference um, <coughs> the, 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 when, when you had the arrow pointing to, to Smith and Tolkien. Um, but for some of them, you had arrows pointing to both of them, some of them only one. Uh, are, are you implying anything there? or? More. That that last um, with the arrows, the last thing in, in my slides was just what that paper was able to trace. It's certainly not uh, indicative of their whole output or, or all the relationships, but just just in that paper we have those influences, mm -hmm. presumably from what I presume. Um, but yes, thank you for for uh, the nightingale. Um, you know, typically. They were white birds in, in the muck of the bird trope, but I, I did read somewhere they were sky blue or the color of rainbows. But I don't remember anything being specifically a, a nightingale. John and Light. Um, well, on that, that's, that's Stuart. Um, the, the nightingale was one of the great symbols of, of the trenches, um, just like the law. So Paul Fussell uh, and his. But the Great War and Modern Memory talks about stand to and the, the, the soldiers would, would stand to attention in the trenches at dawn and dusk. Um, and in the, in the morning, they would be hearing the larks singing, and in the evening, they would be hearing the nightingales singing. And um, so I've, I've um, assumed, not assumed, but I surmise, I guess, that that's the influence on Tolkien and the nightingales. Are there any more questions, comments? Well, if that's it, um, that's the conclusion for session four. We look forward to having you all back in the afternoon.